Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Bethel. Those of you in the house, those of you joining us, God bless you all. It's our privilege to, to be in the presence of the Lord today, in the house of the Lord today. I want to talk today about focus. We are moving into a season of laser focus. Lasers can accomplish what they accomplish because of their focus. And the text I want to begin with, I'm going to read a few, but Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. May God bless the reading of his word. And Luke 9, 51, as the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set his face as flint toward Jerusalem. And listen to Isaiah 50, verse 7. Because the sovereign Lord helps me, I will not be disgraced. Therefore have I set my face like flint, and I know I will not be put to shame. It is a season, beloved, of laser focus. This is a time where we have to be focused in our vision and in our hearing and in our hearts. We need to shut off all the noise and we need to hear the still small voice. And focus, we'll find out this morning, is everything in the kingdom. I just read Hebrews chapter 12, which articulates the Lord Jesus Christ and his mission. It was a mission of utter and complete focus. We are to focus absolutely upon him to the exclusion of all else, as he focused absolutely upon the Father to the exclusion all else, of all else. For the joy set before him, he endured the shame of the cross. We know his story. We know about his sacrifice. But all that he accomplished on our behalf was due to his laser focus concerning the will of the Father. And we're living in a time that if we will gaze at God and glance at the enemy, instead of gazing at the enemy and glancing at God, we will succeed. It's a season of new focus. And I want to talk about focus because too often I know in my life I was unfocused. And I've, I'm noticing at 61 years of age that the Lord is taking the lens of the camera of my life and he is focusing me in a way that I've never been focused before. And what a delicious gift it is. Because life without focus is like having uh, all the equipment for bow and arrow expertise without a target. If you don't have a bullseye because you don't have a target, then you could have the best equipment in the world and you have no focus. You have no you can have every you can have every talent, gift, and ability, but if you don't have a target to focus on, you're going to be living an unfocused life. And an unfocused life is a powerless life. You know what's interesting? I found out this week one of the reasons why. The lion tamers take a chair into the cage. Well, they take a whip and a gun. <laughs> All right. Be smart. Pray and keep your powder dry. But they take a chair because when you take a chair and when you thrust the four legs of the chair at the lion, it disturbs their focus. It drugs them and it makes it very difficult for them to attack because you've broken their focus. They may be hungry, and that's a lot of focus in a creature like that. But if you break the focus of even a, a ravenous lion, they are, they are powerless. They act drugged because they try to focus on every one of the four legs of the chair. Now, and now imagine, you, how many sermons have you heard this week? I'm sure many of you are online all the time, listening to words from the Lord and your favorite preachers, and, 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 and you may hear a word that makes, and it's from the line of the tribe of Judah, and it gives you lion-like faith, and as soon as you come out of that message, the devil pokes four legs of a chair at you 
One leg, your relationship that isn't working. The other leg, your financial situation. The other leg, well, what does the future hold? And the fourth leg, what about the news? And before you know it, you're medicated and the focus is broken and all your strength goes away. Well, our goal today is to encourage you biblically with regard to the need in this next season for us to have a laser focus like we've never had before. And not a focus on everything, but a focus on one thing. How do the ballerinas spin like they do? They have a what? Anyone? <laughs> they have a point. They have a focal point, right? And they, they can't spin unless they have that. Now imagine you're trying to spin like a ballerina does and you don't have a focal point. Well, you see, you're all over the place, right? And the enemy of our soul knows that like with the lion and the lion tamer, if he can break our focus, if he can deter our focus, then he has won the game because power follows focus. When we live an unfocused life, it's an impotent life. It's a powerless life. Or forget about a life without focus. What about a life with the wrong focus? Okay, what about, what about you doing that and you should be doing this? Are you dying on any wrong battlefields in your life? Are you trying to worry about people's business? You know, you're, you're more concerned about someone else's life than they're concerned about their life. Have you ever found in life you're dying on the wrong battlefields? You didn't mean to, but you're so into someone else's life and you're sort of codependent. They say when a codependent jumps off a cliff, what happens? Someone else's life goes before their eyes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so many Christians think it's godly and you're actually a codependent, codependent freak. You're, you're more concerned that other people are happy than they even want to be happy. Have you ever found yourself with the wrong focus? I mean, you're loving people that don't want to be loved. You're helping people that don't want to be helped. You're giving to people that don't want to be given to, you know? The, you know, the analogy, if you're petting the cat and the cat gets up and moves, now that former stroke of love is torture to the cat, Right? Why, it's the same stroke of love. Yeah, but the cat moved, and now you are the devil. There are some people in life, beloved, that if you love them any more, you're going to harm them. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 18, if you have a breach in relationship with a brother and you go to approach the brother to make it good and they will not receive you, you've lost your brother. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. Go to Matthew chapter 18. Read it. We think he's going to give us a magical formula that, you know, if you confess your sins and you go in transparency and, you know, you try to make it right, that everybody's going to be honky-dory. No, you can't shake hands with a clenched fist. If someone refuses your love and your help and your gifts and your ministry, Jesus said, shake the dust off your feet. Quit giving pearls to swine and giving what is sacred to the dogs. Mic drop. All right. It's a season of focus. A life without focus is, is no life at all. A life with the wrong focus. You still drowning in shallow water? I, I love at the end of the Gospel of John, you know, Jesus says to Peter, you know, you've you got a lot of freedom, but when you're old, they're going to take you out and crucify you. And, and Peter says, yeah, well, what about John? And Jesus said, what is that to thee? Why? <laughs> Mind your own business. <laughs> Is what he says. Wrong focus, Peter. See, when you're loving people that don't want to be loved and you're a little confused in your codependency, that's a wrong focus. God won't bless that. Yeah, but, but Pastor Craig, <laughs> I've been watering this wrench garden for 20 years. <laughs> uh -huh. You've been watering screwdrivers and hammers and things by definition that don't grow, can't grow, and you're hurt? I know you're sincere, honey, but, you know, if you just put a thimbleful of what you've been pouring out on them on an actual seed in good ground, you'll have a harvest. It's a time for a new focus. Quit watering hammer gardens. And also, quit praying for ridiculously impossible things. Did you know that even God can't do what's logically impossible? Hold on now. God can't what? God can't make a square circle. 
It's logically impossible. God can't do it. It's impossible for God. It's impossible for you. But I hear Christians praying that. In the name of Jesus, I pray a square circle. Now, in Jesus' name. Um, no. What do you mean, no? Okay, okay, I can't have a square circle. Okay, Lord, make a stick with one end. I want a stick with one end in Jesus' name. No! Jesus! Sorry. Yell, scream, use his name about 20 more times, and you're never going to get a square circle, and you're never going to get a stick with one end because they are logically impossible requests for God and for you. I'm just saying, I'm trying to be nice. Living without focus is hell on earth, and living with the wrong focus, oh, here's another one. Father, I pray you make two mountains without a valley. Now, in the name, read some Isaiah verses. Scream those out, too. Do you see how we've been dying in the wrong battlefield? Do you see how we've had the wrong focus sometimes? We're praying for things that cannot, by definition, happen ever. I always tell the story of the pastor that overheard the little boy down at the altar sobbing and screaming and praying. And the pastor's looking, and the kid's finished, and the pastor, you know, says, Son, I couldn't help but overhearing, you know, at the altar. You were saying, you kept saying, Tokyo, Tokyo, Tokyo. You know, I'm, I'm wondering, were you praying for Japan? He goes, no, I was praying that by tomorrow, when my history test comes in, God will have made Tokyo the capital of California. <laughs> pastor said, well, son, highly unlikely. <laughs> my God can do anything except make a square circle, except make a stick with one hand, except make Tokyo the capital of California by tomorrow. Do you see? Do you see? Focus is so important, but if, if you have no focus, then the devil will try to get you to commit all of who you are to the wrong focus. Why? I don't know why that marriage didn't work. Because he was a serial murderer and drug addict and sexual pervert. That's why it didn't work. I, did, I gave the best years of my life watering a wrench garden. Okay, focus. That's over. The past is the past. Let's start right now and say, I think the next cup of water is going to the roses. The next cup of water. <laughs> Listen to Philippians 3, 13 and 14. Paul says the kingdom of God must become our only focal point. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, listen, what does he do? Forget I forget what's behind, and I strain toward what is ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Focus, Paul said. I have focus. I'm gazing at the goal. I'm not driving looking in the rearview mirror. That's glancing. That'll kill you and everyone in front of you. As sincere as you are, you gaze out of the big window in the car, and you only glance at the little mirror. <laughs> Three mirrors are for glancing. I mean, I, I hope you don't need a post-it note in your car, but I've seen some of you drive. You do. You need to realize gazing, glancing, gazing, glancing, because the minute that the enemy pokes his four chair legs at us, we're neutralized in most cases immediately. He breaks our focus. And we're in, now I remember being in the car. My brother tried to teach me to drive. We had a 1959 Dodge. And my brother, just because he loved it, you know, no seat belts, you know, they were just the slidey seat. And, and my brother got me in the thing in Culver City, and he, he kept leading me. And I go a little, you know, I'm just terrified. I'm holding on. I'm riding the brake. And then he led me right at Overland, right onto the on-ramp, right onto the free. <laughs> oh, my God! Because I don't know, I don't know where to look. The mirrors, nothing. And he and his friend Manny are in the car. They're screaming. They, this is the greatest thing that they've ever seen. And I'm still here to talk. So somehow, going one mile an hour on the <laughs> And the more I went nuts, my brother was just peeing his pants. He was laughing so hard. Anyway, so I'm still here. So the, I guess the lesson to that point is uh, God will deal with your brother in due course. Okay. Focus is so important. And it's interesting because power comes with focus. Proverbs 4.25 says, let your eyes look straight ahead. Fix your gaze directly before you. There's something, focus empowers you to use your bow and your arrow. Now you have 
a bullseye to hit. That just immediately encourages you once you gain your focus. And remember, the enemy is trying to distract you all the time. Doesn't have to be a big hurricane. Doesn't have to be the end of the world. It has to be the little foxes that spoil the vine. The devil knows just how to distract you. Did you know there are people in the Bible that the enemy was able to distract? And some of them are very famous. I'm going to read you just a text. It isn't, uh, it isn't in your bulletin. There's a little guy that was quite famous in the Bible. His name was Solomon. 1 Kings 11, 1, but the King Solomon loved many strange women together with the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians, and Hittites, of the nations concerning which the Lord said unto the children of Israel, Ye shall not go into them, neither shall they come in unto you, for surely they will turn away your heart after their God. Solomon clave unto these in love. Oops. Come on, look at the, there's more than four legs to this chair to break your focus. There's 700 wives and 300 porcupines, uh, concubines. And he had 700 wives there, verse 3. Princesses and 300 concubines and his wives turned away his heart. This is the wisest man that ever lived in the history of the world. Diversion, distraction, because his gift was so amazing when it was focused. Look at the temple he built. Oh. For it came to pass when Solomon was old that his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. For Solomon went after Ashtaroth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. And Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord and went not fully after the Lord, as did David his father. Then did Solomon build a high place for Shemosh, the abomination of Moab in the hill that is before Jerusalem, and for Moloch, the abomination of the children of Ammon. And likewise he did for all his strange wives which burnt incense and sacrificed unto their gods. And the Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart was turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, which had appeared unto him twice and had commanded him concerning this thing that he should not go after other gods, but he kept not that which the Lord commanded. If Solomon can be distracted, and he had more than four legs of a chair <laughs> put before him, you can become distracted. And once your focus is broken, your power leaves. But notice when you have focus, your power is regained. When you have focus, anything is possible for the glory of God. Someone say amen. Oh, my, 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 my. You know, I want to talk for a few minutes. Um, yesterday was Napoleon's birthday, and I just wanted to get that in. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to have Mike make up some graphics or something to show you. But Napoleon won over 90% of the battles that he fought over a 20-year period. Why? Because he wouldn't do what his enemies did. He wouldn't multitask. He would monotask. While all the other armies were multitasking and siphoning off their power. Do you see when you multitask, you, you shift horses in midstream. You're following one vision. It's the story of the lion that comes out and he's following the scent of the deer and then he comes upon the scent of the rabbit and he begins to run after the scent of the rabbit and then he comes upon the scent of the mouse and he runs after the mouse. The mouse goes down in the hole and he ends the day hungrier than his day began. Diversion. Diversion. Do you see? The enemy's goal is to keep you from monotasking in one direction. Because if he can, he's stolen your power. And from that point on, you're just running out of gas, like the four legs pointing at the lion. They're sedated, broken focus. Do you see now? The enemy doesn't have to tempt you with 700 wives and 300 porcupines. All he's got to do is run one photograph past you. <laughs> and you're down. A mooshu devil, some little tiny, you know, I'm a mooshu devil. Yeah, that's it. And, and it's like your focus is broken. <laughs> Come on. Now, we know in this church, um, 
if you try to do a stare down with Gretchen, you're going to you're going to die and go to the nether regions. And I, I remember putting Arwen, who's now 13, I put her on at a dinner. Her and Gretchen went at it with their sphinx singular focus. It's very creepy. <laughs> Because Gretchen's like a baby to look at you and not blink. You know what I mean? Like a dead baby. You know, it's just, you know what I mean? You know when someone looks at, you know they tell you in communication that you're to look down like every seven seconds because people really don't like to be stared at without blinking, right? So you get, that's how the enemy feels when we focus on Christ. Matthew 6.33 says, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. If you seek the things that are only added by definition, you'll never get one of them. Because it's a category mistake. It's praying for a stick with one end. It's praying for two mountains without a valley. It's praying for Tokyo to be made the capital of California in seven hours. Do you see, sincerity is no test for truth. But I'm sincere. Well, the devil's sincere. He's not going to get what he wants. Focus is everything. And when we are focused on Jesus Christ and we are focused on his kingdom first and we are focused and we're only going to focus on the next right thing. You don't focus on everything. Napoleon never focused on everything. In fact, he had no set strategic location or idea. He just got his army going, and he would just start looking for what? Clausewitz calls it kudoi, kudoi, Napoleon's glance. Napoleon studied all of his life. He studied the battles of Alexander the Great. He studied all the battles of Julius Caesar. He studied all the battles of Gustavus Adolphus, all the battles of Frederick the Great. Napoleon's quiver was full of arrows. This guy studied every conceivable context in which a battle could occur, and then he would take his army in motion looking for what? Kudoi. Kudoi means the stroke of the glance. It means what we Christians would call the divine appointment. You know, when I get on a plane and I go, I go, Lord, show me my, well, it's kudoi. There, there it is. Show me my one focus for this plane flight. And I look and I look and I look and I look. And I don't know. I, I wish I could be spiritual and say, before I enter the plane, I knew it was that very large man I was going to sit by. I don't know what kudoi is going to be for me, nor did Napoleon. But he got in motion and he had in his quiver, in his arrow bag, like Legolas, all of his knowledge of every... Con- this kid had studied. It says, it says, history made Napoleon, and then Napoleon made history. All of you watching me, study your Bible. Read the stories. Doesn't have to make sense. Get it in you. Get it in you. Put the arrows in your quiver. Every Bible story. And you may have to go back to your Sunday school books and and, and color paper. Look at the stories of Joseph. Absorb them. Put them in your quiver because when you are in motion looking for a divine appointment, the Lord will mark in a moment her. Her. And when you start talking to her, she just so happens to be a person that needs the arrows in your quiver. And you just so happen to have just gone through that experience. You just so happen to be ripe fruit for that divine appointment. That's how Napoleon won every battle for 20 years. Kudoi, the glance, the moment. Here's how it worked. He studied all the ancient history, all the historical battles, put them as arrows in his quiver. He was a blank slate. He would get his, he'd get his army in motion, and then he'd wait for Kudoi. He'd wait for that moment, and he'd say, there, I want you to apply all the power we have to one point, one strike, and the battle's over. And then he would pursue that point. Focus, focus, fo- monotasking, not multitasking. Well, you know, I always wanted to study psychology in school, and so I studied for two weeks, and then I changed my major to physics, and then I changed my major to dog food because I believe dog food is a very— Do you ever heard people that have no focus talk? And then I came up, and I do how people without focus spend money, how people without focus do anything, love people, how people without focus date. 
without focus or with the wrong focus, you're dead in the water. And the enemy doesn't even need to worry about you because you're on a shelf, harmless. But I'm here to encourage you today, not make you want to go bye-bye. All right, so <laughs> it's <laughs> you can regain your focus. You can regain your first love. You can regain, as Paul had to, his absolute focus on the work of the kingdom. And, 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 and it's interesting, the more you focus, every, see, Napoleon said that this, the art of war is to bring to bear at one point, one point, all your resources. See, we don't have a lot of resources, but if we can bring them all together at one point in a singular focus, pow, one strike and the battle's over. Now, do you know when Napoleon failed? You know the only time he failed? Is when he, f- he didn't do kudoi. He did not follow his previous practices. He told everybody where he was going, Russia. Napoleon, get, get, get Alexander's army. Don't take Moscow. Everybody else sets objectives. And, and no, 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 don't do it. I told the 600,000 men sent to their death and destruction because this fool decided to not do what he'd been doing for 20 years, which is you're a blank slate. You need a singular focus. Ignore your enemies. Count on surprise. And did you know God's trying to reinstill in each of us the passion that we once had? Do you know when you are in love, you are focused? You don't need tapes on focus. You don't need to listen to me. (laughs) We're in love. You don't need to be told to hug and kiss. You don't need to be told anything. Now, formally, as one grabs the hand of a woman, one must arc over to the... You don't need commandments when you're in love because in love is a focus beyond anything. And we can all tell when you're in love and we can all tell when you're out of love because that laser focus (laughs) is gone. (laughs) I don't have that laser focus anymore. I don't know. Listen to this. Quote, it took six years of work, but scientists at Jet Propulsion Laboratory have created the world's most sensitive telescope. How sensitive? Imagine an astronaut standing on the moon 250,000 miles from Earth, smiling for the camera. This telescope, say the scientists, could tell us if she were wiggling her pinky. Such an instrument requires a vacuum-sealed chamber and the ability to focus within one-tenth the width of a hydrogen atom. In plain terms, that's about one millionth of the width of the thickest human hair. The purpose of this amazing telescope, called the MicroArc Second Metrology Test Bed, is to search for telltale movements of Earth-sized planets that might be orbiting around stars in distant galaxies, all tens of light years away. The benefits of such microscope of such a microscope and fine-tuning are limitless and include the possibility of identifying distant planets that sustain life. Wow! Focus! <laughs> That's laser focus, right? That's not vague. Well, you know, I, I see the moon already. What do we need to see the moon for? God is tuning us now in the kingdom to be microscopes like this. It hurts a bit. It's like, what's he doing? He's trying to call you back to focus. He's trying to shift you and pull your cold, dead hands off the wrong focus. You know, no, only when he dies will I move forward. Don't watch what you pray for. (laughs) You might get it. (laughs) Whoops. You see, he wants us refocused. He wants us broken off over the wrong focus. And he wants us to realize that the more focused we are and the more we are focused on monotasking, that means you pick one goal he's going to give you in the next little while. Here's how it all shakes out. He's going to give you one focus. And he's going to ask you to monotask. That means shut out all the noise and every other focus except the monofocus. And start it and then finish it. It's a project. Invent a project. I'm going to clean my room. Well, wait a minute. Now he lost me. We were up in the airy heights of theology. And now he's quit to preach and had gone to meddling. Yeah. Clean your room. Okay. 
There's your focus. That's the next right thing, and you're going to monotask. Okay, you're not going to pick up the first item in cleaning the room and realize it's a photo book you haven't seen since junior high. I'm going to sit down now and call my junior high friends. Hey, how's it going? Hey, I was in my room. Okay, yeah, Craig. Craig, Craig Johnson, the irritating kid. We were in. So anyway, so I'm in the Do you see how the enemy, as soon as you begin to monotask in one direction to knock down one domino that would actually change your life and advance the kingdom, the enemy shows you one of four legs of a chair. Okay? You're going to study a topic. Oh, but you get in the library, and now there are 5,000 topics. So I'm going to study Julius Caesar today and Cleopatra, and then I'm going to study wallpaper, and then I'm totally distracted and powerless. And the enemy in my life has just been able to distract me with good things. It's not like he's waving wicked things in front of my face. Like I've told you before, you, have, you are not tempted to rob a bank. Well, let's say in principle, you weren't. It's a sermon point. Robo Bank. Have you seen that one? It's like, you know, I was subliminally forced to rob that Israeli bank. Um, you're not probably tempted to break in, risk your life, and rob a bank. So the enemy will not tempt you with that and will not distract you with that. He'll not distract you usually with evil things, but with good things rather than the best thing. Just a good man instead of a best man. And you're still water in the ranch garden. 20 years later, and we counsel you, and we tell you, and you know, and you could counsel yourself better than God could counsel you, but you're still watering wrenches, and you're mad at God. I can't lift my head to pray, <laughs> because he, he what? He's been watering wrenches for the last 20 years. All your friends that told you to quit watering wrenches, all the wrenches that cry out from the elements and go, quit watering me. <laughs> and you're still going to be stuck and broken. Where's my stick with one end? That's what I'm going to ask God when I get to heaven. I'm going to put God in the dock. <laughs> and I'm going to say, where are two mountains without a valley? You're not going to do if you get there. <laughs> Should be the caveat. Anyway, why do I have five dollars? Oh, this was my bookmark. At this church, we have Bible bookmarks that'll astonish you. All right. It's a season of focus. <laughs> As I get back to my focus, my focus. <laughs> oh, you're all, <laughs> may the Lord deal with every one of you. Oh, sometimes you just have to say goodbye. Um, as we close, see what happens right in front of you. In mime, I acted out distraction. <laughs> You'll never stand before the throne of God and say, well, I didn't know what that looked like. Yes, you do. Okay, I'm back. So it was Napoleon's birthday yesterday, and I couldn't help but think of Kudoy, Napoleon's glance. All the biblical knowledge, all the personal life experience and wisdom that you have are arrows in the quiver. Then you're a blank slate, and you're open, and you're looking around for the unexpected. The aha moment, kudoy, there it is. Then put everything you have behind that one target in your utter focus, and God will anoint you and give you a victory in that area. Do the next right thing with that kind of passion. And you know what? As long as Napoleon did it, and monotasked and didn't multitask. See, in multitasking, what I'm referring to is, well, multitasking isn't bad. Well, it is when it becomes you're studying physics and now you're going to study geometry and now you're going to study uh, the, the Henry Ford's history of the car. And now you're, see, you, you can't, once you stop your momentum, you're in a train, you're going 50 miles an hour and you stop the entire train, get off and you get on a new train and it needs to start. The coal will be in in half an hour and then we'll start getting on our way. See, in the spirit, we're watching you, and we're seeing if you just stay in mono focus, if you just stay in mono tasking, and you fulfill one goal God gives you. Row in the power of the last word he gave you before you look for a new word. Clean your room. And when that's over, you can look at the junior high photo album and call everybody.
Oh, I got another one here as we close. You ever wondered why a pigeon walks so funny? According to the Detroit Free Press, a pigeon walks the way it does so it can see where it's going because it can't adjust its focus as it moves. The pigeon actually has to bring its head to a complete stop between steps in order to refocus. This is the way it walks. Head forward, stop, head back, and stop. In our spiritual walk with the Lord, we have the same problem as the pigeon. We have a hard time seeing while we're moving. We also need to stop between steps to refocus on where we are in relation to the world and the will of God. Focus. And we can refocus. Now, I don't care if you've been the unfocused person your whole life until now and you're 109. There's hope. Well, I know some preachers that would say there's hope. And um, tune in after I go out. <laughs> Those of you that have had no focus, it's okay. Those of you that have the wrong focus, that's my primary, that's the brick I'm hitting a thousand times. Because you folk that have been watering ranch gardens and praying for sticks with one hand, that has got to stop now. Because the enemy doesn't even need to touch you because you are just off a train off the track, laying sideways with your wheels going, spinning. And if, you just, if he leaves you alone long enough, you'll die. And someone said, amen, I know somewhere in your world. But uh, do you see the importance of us recalibrating now, recommitting our lives like the pigeons? We need to stop right now and we need to refocus. And I want to pray right now in the name of Jesus that you would come to a new place, beloved, where all you've learned all your life, all the wisdom, all the knowledge, all the Bible, all the life lessons will now create in you a blank slate that's open to adventure where you're just going to start scanning your horizon and aha, Kudoy is going to hit, the aha moment. And you're going to say, "That's I shoot all my arrows at that target. And then you're going to follow through doing the next right thing with all the talent you have. And guess what? God's anointing is going to come upon you and you will bear more fruit monotasking in five minutes than you've lost in your distraction the last 32 years. Because the Lord is going to bless you. He's going to regain your focus for you. In fact, just like that ballerina, we're going to get that focal point, which is Jesus Christ. So we can spin and come right back to it. Spin and come right back to it. Father, I pray for my precious brother, Lord, who has lost his focus. Maybe many years ago, and the focal point was erased from the wall, and he's been spinning and just falling around crazy. For soul, and just, just looks like a mess. He'd been falling down the flights of stairs. But Lord, you can draw the focal point on the wall, one dot, and he can refocus in a second. Right now, I pray for my brother, Lord, that he would regain his focus in a moment, suddenly, right now. And that all those lost years are lost, and we let them go, and we let them sink beneath the waves like the Titanic. And we get in our little tugboat, we get in our little boat and we are going to survive this season. We are going to regain our focus. And Father, for my sisters that have maybe been, they've had the wrong focus. Maybe they've been looking to the wrong people to love them. And maybe they've been looking to the wrong teaching to feed them. And maybe they've been looking, whatever it is, we, we, we know you can push the odometer zero, zero, zero and wipe it all off right now. And Paul, we're like Paul, we're going to let the past sink. We're not going to, we're going to gaze at the future focus and only glance at the past. We're going to let it go. And we're going to ask you to recalibrate my sister's focus so she can monotask from this moment on. And instead of reading 10 books on 10 different subjects, she's going to read one book the next year and learn everything about that one topic. And I thank you, Lord, for my brothers and sisters. Instead of trying to uh, learn too many things at one time, they're going to master one thing that you direct them to study and become the world-renowned expert on one issue where they can monotask. And we ask you to do it in Jesus' name. And we pray you refresh us, Lord. Let us hear the still, small voice and ignore all the noise. Let our one focus be your voice. And we will only gaze at that and we will only glance at the noise in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. God bless you as you refocus your life. Can we give the Lord a praise? Isn't he faithful, our focused Lord, who focused 
and won our salvation because of his focused gaze on the Father and his perfect will. Praise his holy name. He's the captain of our salvation. He's the one we're looking to. And remember, when we seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, all these things are going to be added to us. Amen. God bless you. We hope today's message has been a blessing to you. And if it has, please visit our website at drcraigjohnson.org. There you can find additional messages of encouragement. And if our ministry has been a blessing to you, please consider us in your ministry giving, as we depend solely on the financial assistance of our listeners like yourself. Also, please feel free to send any personal prayer requests. You can find us online at drcraigjohnson.org. God bless you.